the song of the sirens, encountering the imaginary. The sirens. Evidently, they really sang, but in a way that was not satisfying, that only implied in which direction lay the true sources of the song, the true happiness of the song. Nevertheless, through their imperfect song, songs which were only a song still to come, they guided the sailor towards that space where singing would really begin. They were therefore not deceiving him. They were really leading him to his goal. But what happened when he reached that place? What was that place? It was a place where the only thing left was to disappear, because in this region of source and origin, music itself had disappeared more completely than in any other place in the world. It was like a sea into which the living would sink with their ears closed, and where the sirens too, even they, as proof of their goodwill, would one day have to disappear. What sort of song was the siren song? What was its defect? Why did this defect make it so powerful? The answer some people have always given is that it was an inhuman song. No doubt a natural noise. What other kind is there? But one that remained in the margins of nature. In any case, it was foreign to man and very low awakening in him that extreme delight in falling which he cannot satisfy in the normal conditions of his life. But, others say, there was something even stranger in this enchantment. It caused the sirens merely to reproduce the ordinary singing of mankind, and because the sirens, who were only animals, very beautiful animals because they reflected womanly beauty, could sing the way men sing. Their song became so extraordinary that it created in anyone who heard it a suspicion that all human singing was really inhuman. Was it despair then that killed men moved to passion by their own singing? That despair verged upon rapture. There was something marvellous about the song. It actually existed. It was ordinary and at the same time secret a simple everyday song which they were suddenly forced to recognize, sung in an unreal way by strange powers, powers which were, in a word, imaginary. It was a song from the abyss, and once heard it opened an abyss in every utterance, and powerfully enticed whoever heard it to disappear into that abyss. Remember that this song was sung to sailors, men prepared to take risks and fearless in their impulses. And it was a form of navigation, too. It was a distance, and what it revealed was the possibility of travelling the distance, of making the song into a movement towards the song, and of making this movement into the expression of the greatest desire. Strange navigation. And what was its goal? It has always been possible to believe that those who approached it were not able to do more than approach it. That they died from impatience, from having said too soon, here it is, here is where I will drop anchor. Others have claimed that, on the contrary, it was too late. The goal had always been overshot. The enchantment held out an enigmatic promise, and through this promise exposed men to the danger of being unfaithful to themselves, unfaithful to their human song, and even to the essence of song, by awakening in them hope and the desire for a marvellous beyond. And that beyond was only a desert, as though the region where music originated was the only place completely without music, a sterile, dry place where silence, 
like noise, burned all access to the song in anyone who had once had command of it. Does this mean that there was something evil in the invitation which issued from the depths? Were the sirens nothing more than unreal voices, as custom would have us believe? Unreal voices which were not supposed to be heard, a deception intended to seduce, and which could only be resisted by disloyal or cunning people? Men have always made a rather ignoble effort to discredit the sirens by accusing them flatly of lying. They were liars when they sang, frauds when they sighed, fictions when they were touched, non-existent in every way. And the good sense of Ulysses was enough to do away with this puerile non-existence. It is true, Ulysses did overcome them. But how did he do it? Ulysses, the stubbornness and caution of Ulysses, the treachery by which he took pleasure in the spectacle of the sirens without risking anything and without accepting the consequences. This cowardly, mediocre and tranquil pleasure, this moderate pleasure appropriate to a Greek of the period of decadence who never deserved to be the hero of the Iliad, this happy and confident cowardice, rooted in a privilege which set him apart from the common condition, the others having no right to such elite happiness, but only to the pleasure of seeing their leader writhe ludicrously, grimacing with ecstasy in empty space, but also a right to the satisfaction of gaining mastery over their master. No doubt this was the lesson they learned. This was for them the true song of the sirens. Ulysses' attitude, the amazing deafness of a man who is deaf because he can hear, was enough to fill the sirens with a despair, which until then had been felt only by men, and this despair turned them into real and beautiful girls, just this once, real and worthy of their promise, and therefore capable of vanishing into the truth and depth of their song. Even once the sirens had been overcome by the power of technology, which will always claim to trifle in safety with unreal, inspired powers, Ulysses was still not free of them. They enticed him to a place which he did not want to fall into, and, hidden in the heart of the Odyssey, which had become their tomb, they drew him and many others, into that happy, unhappy voyage, which is the voyage of the tale, of a song which is no longer immediate, but is narrated, and because of this, made to seem harmless, an ode which is turned into an episode. The Secret Law of the Tale This is not an allegory. A very obscure struggle takes place between every tale and the encounter with the sirens, that enigmatic song which is powerful because of its insufficiency. A struggle in which Ulysses' prudence, whatever degree he has of truth, of mystification, of obstinate ability not to play the game of the gods, has always been exercised and perfected. What we call the novel was born of this struggle. What lies in the foreground of the novel is the previous voyage, the voyage which takes Ulysses to the moment of the encounter. This voyage is a completely human story. It takes place within the framework of human time. It is bound up with men's passions. It actually takes place and is rich enough and varied enough to consume all the narrator's strength and attention. Once the tale has become a novel, far from appearing poorer, it takes on all the richness and breadth of an exploration, one which sometimes embraces the immensity of the voyage, and sometimes confines itself to a small patch of space on the deck, and occasionally descends into the depths of the ship, where no one ever knew what the hope of the sea was. 
the rule the sailors must obey is this. No illusion can be made to a goal or destination, and with good reason, surely. No one can sail away with the deliberate intention of reaching the Isle of Capri. No one can set his course for it. And if anyone decides to go there, he will still proceed only by chance, by some chance to which he is linked by an understanding difficult to penetrate. The rule is therefore silence, discretion, forgetfulness. We must recognize that a certain preordained modesty, a desire not to have any pretensions and not to lead to anything, would be enough to make many novels irreproachable books and to make the genre of the novel the most attractive of genres, the one which, in its discretion and its cheerful nothingness, takes upon itself the task of forgetting what others degrade by calling it the essential. Diversion is its profound song. To keep changing direction, to move on in an apparently random way, avoiding all goals, with an uneasy motion that is transformed into a happy sort of distraction, this has been its primary and most secure justification. It is no small thing to make a game of human time, and out of that game to create a free occupation, one stripped of all immediate interest and usefulness essentially superficial, and yet in its surface movement, capable of absorbing all being. But clearly, if the novel fails to play this role today, it is because technics has transformed men's time and their way of amusing themselves. The tale begins at a point where the novel does not go, though in its refusals and its rich neglect, it is leading towards it. Heroically, pretentiously, the tale is the tale of one single episode, that in which Ulysses encounters the inadequate and enticing song of the sirens. Except for the great, naive pretension, apparently nothing has changed, and because of its form, the tale seems to continue to fulfil its ordinary vocation as a narrative. For example, Aurelia is presented as the simple account of the meeting, and so is une saison en enfer, and so is Nadia. Something has happened, something which someone has experienced who tells about it afterwards, in the same way that Ulysses needed to experience the event and to survive it in order to become Homer, who told about it. Of course, the tale is usually about an exceptional event one which eludes the forms of everyday time and the world of the usual sort of truth, perhaps any truth. This is why it so insistently rejects everything which could connect it with the frivolity of a fiction. The novel, on the other hand, contains only what is believable and familiar, and yet is very anxious to pass for fiction. In the Gorgias, Plato says, Listen to a beautiful tale. Now you will think it is a fable, but I believe it is a tale. I will tell you what I am going to tell you as a true thing. What he told was the story of the Last Judgment. Yet if we regard the tale as the true telling of an exceptional event which has taken place and which someone is trying to report, then we have not even come close to sensing the true nature of the tale. The tale is not the narration of an event, but that event itself, the approach to that event, the place where that event is made to happen, an event which is yet to come, and through whose power of attraction the tale can hope to come into being, too. This is a very delicate relationship, Undoubtedly a kind of extravagance, but it is the secret law of the tale. The tale is a movement towards a point, a point which is not only unknown, obscure, foreign, but such that apart from this movement it does not seem to have any sort of real prior existence, and yet it is so imperious that the tale derives its power of attraction only from this point, so that it cannot even begin before reaching it. 
and yet only the tail and the unpredictable movement of the tail create the space where the point becomes real, powerful, and alluring. When Ulysses becomes Homer. What would happen if instead of being two distinct people, Ulysses and Homer comfortably shared their roles and were one in the same presence? If the tale Homer told was simply Ulysses' movement within the space opened up for him by the song of the sirens, if Homer's capacity to narrate were limited by how far he went as Ulysses, a Ulysses free of all impediments, though tied down, towards the place where the power to speak and to narrate was apparently promised to him as long as he disappeared there. This is one of the strange things about the tale, or, shall we say, one of its pretensions. It only narrates itself, and in the same moment that this narration comes into being, it creates what it is narrating. It cannot exist as a narration unless it creates what is happening in that narration, because then it contains the point or the plane where the reality described by the story can keep uniting with its reality as a tale, can secure this reality and be secured by it. But isn't this a rather naive madness? In one sense, yes. That is why there are no tales, and that is why there is no lack of tales. To listen to the song of the sirens is to cease to be Ulysses and become Homer. But only in Homer's story does the real encounter take place, where Ulysses becomes the one who enters into a relationship with the force of the elements and the voice of the abyss. This seems obscure. It is like the embarrassment the first man would have felt if, in order to be created, he himself had had to renounce in a completely human way the divine fiat lux that would actually cause his eyes to open. Actually, this way of presenting things simplifies them a great deal, which is why it produces these artificial or theoretical complications. Of course, it is true that only in Melville's book does Ahab meet Moby Dick, yet it is also true that only this encounter allows Melville to write the book. It is such an imposing encounter, so enormous, so special that it goes beyond all the levels on which it takes place, all the moments in time where we attempt to situate it, and seems to be happening long before the book begins. But it is of such a nature that it also could not happen more than once, in the future of the work, and in that sea which is what the work will be, having become an ocean on its own scale. Ahab and the whale are engaged in a drama, what we can call a metaphysical drama, using the word loosely. And the sirens and Ulysses are engaged in the same struggle. Each wants to be everything, wants to be the absolute world, which would make it impossible for him to coexist with the other absolute world. And yet the greatest desire of each is for this coexistence and this encounter. To bring Ahab and the whale, the sirens and Ulysses together in one space. This is the secret wish which turns Ulysses into Homer and Ahab into Melville, and makes the world that results from this union into the greatest, most terrible, and most beautiful of all possible worlds. A book, alas, only a book. Of Ahab and Ulysses, the one with the greater will to power is not the more liberated. Ulysses has the kind of deliberate stubbornness which leads to universal domination. His trick is to seem to limit his power. In a cold and calculating way, he finds out what he can still do, faced with the other power. He will be everything if he can maintain a limit, if he can preserve that interval between the real and the imaginary, which is just what the song of the sirens invites him to cross. The result is a sort of victory for him, a dark disaster for Ahab. We cannot deny that Ulysses understood something of what Ahab saw, but he stood fast within that understanding, 
while Ahab became lost in the image. In other words, one resisted the metamorphosis, while the other entered it and disappeared inside it. After the test, Ulysses is just as he had been before, and the world is poorer, perhaps, but firmer and more sure. Ahab is no longer, and for Melville himself, the world keeps threatening to sink into that worldless space towards which the fascination of one single image draws him. The Metamorphosis The tale is bound up with the metamorphosis alluded to by Ulysses and Ahab. The action that the tale causes to take place in the present is that of metamorphosis on all the levels it can attain, if for the sake of convenience, because this statement cannot be exact. We say that what makes the novel move forward is everyday collective or personal time, or more precisely, the desire to urge time to speak then the tale moves forward through that other time. It makes that other voyage, which is the passage from the real song to the imaginary song, the movement which causes the real song to become imaginary little by little, though all at once. And this little by little, though all at once, is the very time of the metamorphosis. To become an enigmatic song always at a distance, designating this distance as a space to be crossed and designating the place to which it leads as the point where singing will cease to be a lure. The tale wants to cross this space and what moves it is the transformation demanded by the empty fullness of this space, a transformation which takes place in all directions and no doubt powerfully transforms the writer but transforms the tale itself, no less, and everything at stake in the tale, where, in a sense, nothing happens except this very crossing. And yet, what was more important for Melville than the encounter with Moby Dick, an encounter which is taking place now and is, at the same time, always imminent, so that he keeps moving towards it in a stubborn and disorderly quest? But since this encounter is just as closely related to the source, it also seems to be sending him back into the depths of the past. Proust lived under the fascination of this experience, and in part succeeded in writing under it. People will object, saying, but the events they are talking about belong primarily to the lives of Melville, Nerval, Proust. It is because they have already met Aurelia, because they have tripped over the uneven paving stones, seen the three church towers, that they can begin to form an image, a story, or words, that will let us share a vision close to their own vision. Unfortunately, things are not that simple. All the ambiguity arises from the ambiguity of time, which comes into place here and which allows us to say and to feel that the fascinating image of the experience is present at a certain moment, even though this presence does not belong to any present, and even destroys the present which it seems to enter. It is true, Ulysses was really sailing, and one day, on a certain date, he encountered the enigmatic song. And so he can say, now, this is happening now. But what happened now? The presence of a song which was still to be sung. And what did he touch in the presence? Not the occurrence of an encounter which had become present, but the overture of the infinite movement which is the encounter itself, always at a distance, from the place where it asserts itself and the moment when it asserts itself. Because it is this very distance, this imaginary distance, in which absence is realized. And only at the end of this distance does the event begin to take place, 
at a point where the proper truth of the encounter comes into being, and where, in any case, the words which speak it would originate. Always still to come, always in the past already, always present, beginning so abruptly that it takes your breath away, and yet unfurling itself like the eternal return and renewal. Ah, says Goethe, in another age you were my sister or my wife. This is the nature of the event for which the tale is the approach. This event upsets relations in time, and yet affirms time. The particular way time happens. The tale's own time, which enters the narrator's duration in such a way as to transform it. And the time of the metamorphoses, where the different temporal ecstasies coincide in an imaginary simultaneity. And in the form of the space, which art is trying to create fame, if for the sake of convenience, because this statement cannot be exact, we say that what makes the novel move forward is everyday collective or personal time, or more precisely, the desire to urge time to speak. Then the tale moves forward through that other time. It makes that other voyage, which is the passage from the real song to the imaginary song, the movement which causes the real song to become imaginary little by little, though all at once. And this little by little, though all at once, is the very time of the metamorphosis. To become an enigmatic song always at a distance, designating this distance as a space to be crossed, and designating the place to which it leads as the point where singing will cease to be a lure. The tale wants to cross this space, and what moves it is the transformation demanded by the empty fullness of this space, a transformation which takes place in all directions, and no doubt powerfully transforms the writer, but transforms the tale itself no less, and everything at stake in the tale, where in a sense nothing happens except this very crossing. And yet... What was more important for Melville than the encounter with Moby Dick, an encounter which is taking place now and is, at the same time, always imminent, so that he keeps moving towards it in a stubborn and disorderly quest? But since this encounter is just as closely related to the source, it also seems to be sending him back into the depths of the past. Proust lived under the fascination of this experience, and in part succeeded in writing under it. People will object, saying, but the events they are talking about belong primarily to the lives of Melville, Nerval, Proust. It is because they have already met Aurelia, because they have tripped over the uneven paving stones, seen the three church towers, that they can begin to form an image, a story, or words that will let us share a vision close to their own vision. Unfortunately, things are not that simple. All the ambiguity arises from the ambiguity of time, which comes into place here, and which allows us to say and to feel that the fascinating image of the experience is present at a certain moment even though this presence does not belong to any present, and even destroys the present which it seems to enter. It is true, Ulysses was really sailing, and one day, on a certain date, he encountered the enigmatic song. And so he can say, now, this is happening now. But what happened now? The presence of a song which was still to be sung, and what did he touch in the presence? Not the occurrence of an encounter which had become present, but the overture of the infinite movement which is the encounter itself, always at a distance, from the place where it asserts itself, and the moment when it asserts itself. 
because it is this very distance, this imaginary distance, in which absence is realized. And only at the end of this distance does the event begin to take place, at a point where the proper truth of the encounter comes into being, and where, in any case, the words which speak it would originate. Always still to come, always in the past already, always present, beginning so abruptly that it takes your breath away, and yet unfurling itself like the eternal return and renewal. Ah, says Goethe, in another age you were my sister or my wife. This is the nature of the event for which the tale is the approach. This event upsets relations in time, and yet affirms time. The particular way time happens. The tale's own time, which enters the narrator's duration in such a way as to transform it. And the time of the metamorphoses, where the different temporal ecstasies coincide in an imaginary simultaneity. And in the form of the space, which art is trying to create.